Good morning, all genders. S4, did you miss me? Good. Thanks, Mom. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the book, about cyber risk. I did just say cyber, so all my old friends can drink. Uh, I apologize for that, but my colleagues at the Center for Risk Studies wanted to work on cyber projects. So I went over there from the computer lab to work on risk and to reframe my engineering approach on uh, computer security and especially OT security to focus on this kind of risk perspective. So instead of worrying about one business, I wanted to worry about all the businesses. And that's kind of how I ended up here uh, at S4 in the first place a few years ago. I care about infrastructure. I want to protect all the infrastructures and make sure that they function and people get water and they get electricity and so on and so forth. You, you know this story. All of you basically share the same story. So in S4.15, I talked about cyber insurance. I said, I want to bring some new capacity to defenders, right? I want some new money, some new help, some new technical talent, a new approach to this. And uh, the response was underwhelming. Um, a lot of people did not like the idea. They didn't think it would work. And I believe uh, one of the major critiques was that this would happen. Uh, one of the insurers would sue under a war exclusion, and they wouldn't pay out. Um, and that's true. It has happened. However, it will not stop cyber insurance. We'll still have cyber insurance. Uh, cyber insurance will learn from this experience. There's another two or three court cases involved in this. And this will take a little while for the dust to, to settle. But once it does settle, the market will have clarity and we will understand how cyber insurance is going to work. Let me describe it to you from an insurer's perspective, just for a moment. I know it's not the perspective you want or you've traditionally heard from me, uh, but we'll, we'll go with it anyways. Um, imagine you're an insurer and you've got all these products, property and casualty, life insurance, health insurance, small business, directors and operators, and you haven't priced cyber risk into this. You haven't considered cyber risk in all these other lines of coverage. So that means you have to readjust your rates to account for what is now happening in the real world on a daily basis. Or you create an entirely new line of insurance which has been done all throughout history. Like there was a point where piracy insurance was created, kidnap and ransom insurance was created, and so on. And that's the era that we're living in. So these court cases are going to settle some things for the market, and that will mean we'll either get explicit cyber insurance or this kind of silent coverage where they have to price it into all the other insurance uh, that you're buying anyway. Now, I personally don't work for an insurance company. I'm not uh, interested in being an insurance company. I like consulting with them on the risk metrics, and that's the rest of the presentation that you're going to see today is on those kinds of risk metrics. But I also work for companies that don't want to buy insurance. So they self-insure, right? They're interested in doing this themselves, having their own security team, having their own incident response team, and setting aside a little money for a rainy day so they can grow uh, that incident response capacity in a crisis, the sort of surge capacity. So, as I said, previously, people told me it was impossible. I can assure you that it is profitable. I've spent the last three years working in this space, and we now have Pool Re covering physical damage in the UK for cyber terrorism, right? Uh, this JLT is uh, a broker that's talking to people about cyber insurance for the manufacturing se sector. And I'm really proud of that. It's not going to affect your security budgets. It's not going to make them go away, and I'll talk a lot about that. But I'm proud of the fact that we have made this possible over the last three years. And it's an exciting space to work in. So let me tell you a little bit of something, a story. Um, I recently got engaged, and I went to Turkey to relax with my partner. And uh, there's a beautiful place that we spent some time, and I wanted to do some work while I was there. So I was, I was analyzing ransomware sitting on a terrace, you know, watching the boats sail by, looking at 31,000 samples of ransomware. And of course, we're talking about it. And she makes the inevitable joke, right? Why don't you just write some ransomware? Uh, you've just determined that they've made like 88 million with your friends from these various places studying the blockchain. You know, that's a lot of money. They made 88 million, Aaron. Why don't you, why don't you go and do insurance? And I said to her, the insurance industry is losing 3 billion to one family of ransomware. She said, that's not an answer. That's true. I'd rather work for an industry that can lose three billion and still be profitable than go and sell ransomware, aside from the effect on my reputation, right? So there it is. They can lose three billion and keep making money and learn things about the loss process and improve them over time. And I think that's very exciting. 
So let me tell you how I went on this journey. Uh, a guy called Andrew Coburn, one of my co-authors, and Gordon Wu, uh, the two of them came to me and said, would you like to come and work at the Risk Center, leave your cushy job at IOActive, and, and come and do some mathematics with us, do some equations. Uh, and I said, I don't really think you can quantize this stuff. I don't think that you can put cyber into an equation. I don't think all the hacking that I did at IOActive can just be uh, written off like that in, in, in numbers. But I was young, and uh, I needed a break, and I certainly enjoyed spending time with some very clever people. And they pointed out to me, adversarial risk has a history, right? We had pirates. We still have pirates. Uh, but you can do the maths of how many pirates are in the world and how much money they make and how many ships are going past. And there is an adversarial risk mathematics of, of piracy. And I started speaking to Gordon, Gordon Wu. He's a terrorism expert. They told him that terrorism insurance uh, was impossible too when he got started. But he slowly quantized that over time. I went and spoke to some of the kidnap and ransom people, and they said, we have the same problem. We adapt our techniques in negotiation. Uh, you know, the other side changes their techniques. We have this kind of game theory problem where we can never quite move the needle on it. Uh, but we do have some mathematics around it. And finally, of course, war. Can you quantize war in some sense? Can we get an idea of how likely it is that any of us would die in a conflict? I know that's a cheery thought uh, so early in the morning, but um, the answer is yes. You can, you can look at Max uh, Roser's work. You can see uh, a log scale on the left-hand side. You can see the size of various conflicts and civilian deaths and military deaths. There is an adversarial risk, risk mathematics, and I encourage you to get out there and look up some of this literature and understand it. It can be extraordinarily useful in the way that you think about uh, the problems of hacking. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to show you that. We've quantized a number of different things. There's still more work to be done. It's not a finished job. Uh, but I'll give you a sense of how we work and how we, how we do some of these things, right? So why, why did I end up doing this? I got frustrated with the InfoSec industry. I love it. I still work here. I still speak to you. But I felt like a lot of the times I was giving people advice. And I would come back to see them again in a year's time and do another penetration test. And they still hadn't necessarily fixed the problems of the last time. And it's not that they were lazy or they weren't doing their work. You know, they were doing a lot of work, working with vendors, trying to get things fixed. It's a slow process to fix all of these things. But I also thought there's a little bit of a disincentive. When I was at Cambridge University for my master's, we taught uh, security economics, right? We had to focus a lot on security economics. And the incentives are wrong. We don't profit if these hacks go away as security companies, right? We're not liable for giving bad security or privacy advice yet in many countries. Um, we think zero sum. We ask to do the risk about ourselves, like our own company, our own household, our own little group of people, our own nation. And we don't take like a collective view of, of cyber risk. Um, so that zero sum thinking and that unilateral thinking keeps us from solving a lot of these problems. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So what if we think of security as a public good? What, what do I mean by public good? I mean, it's something indivisible. I can't make myself more secure unless I also make you more secure. And I'll give you an example of why I think that's true. Let's say I've secured my email. I've done it perfectly, which nobody in the room believes is possible, I hope. But let's say that I have, theoretically. I still exchange emails with the rest of you. And so if your email is insecure, my emails can still be read. So there's some risk transfer between the two of us every time we have a communication, every time we do business, every time we transfer money. And so we need to share a, a level of security within a group to be able to operate and do business. All right, so what if we take that collective view of risk and we take it a bit further and we look at the new paradigm? So this is the fun stuff. It turns out that exploits are quantifiable, right? Uh, the graph here on the left is the usage of different CVEs. So it's not specific exploits, but we know that in these incidents, this is from a lot of uh, incident responder data that I have access to, and you'll find out a little bit more about why in the future. Um, but these are the CVEs that are used in those exploits. And you can see overwhelmingly certain CVEs are more popular in use with the attackers than others. And the other graph is basically the amount of time. It's like an exploit half-life. How long are these vulnerabilities used in time? What's the frequency of use of those different vulnerabilities over time? OK, this is a good start. Exploits are quantifiable. APTs are not equal, but they are also quantifiable. I'm still doing this research. There's still some problems with it, but I will show you the basics of what we're doing. 
Um, this graph here on the left-hand side is a representation of the frequency with which different attackers come from different slash 16s on the internet. So you can see without a doubt that they use certain networks more commonly than others. And to most people in the room, you're just thinking bulletproof hostings. You've put it in a graph. Well done. And that's why this presentation is for you. On the other side, of course, we have a different representation of the same data spread out over the IPv4 internet. And don't forget, IPv4 is not the only internet. Just because you can scan IPv4 does not mean you can scan the entire internet. We still have IPv6. There are a few other routable protocols out there. It's a big world, and it's complicated. So we're going to need to quantize these things. All right, so if we go back to this for a minute, take a basic idea here. Uh, logistical budget was how Gordon put it to me. I was asking him about terrorism, and he said, Look, we take these SAS guys and you know, these former Special Forces guys from America, from China, from wherever, and we go to these sites and we say, if you were going to blow up this building, if you were going to damage it in some way, uh, what would you do? If you were going to take a plane out of the sky, what would you do? How long would it take you? How many people do you need? You know, how many people are going to do this job? How many hours do they need and how much money do they have? And they call that the logistical burden. Well, I thought, we have all these indicators of compromise, right? Every network takes some amount of time to either pop the box or buy the address from the ISP. Every domain that you use has to be generated. The DNS has to be purchased, so on and so forth. There's money, manpower, and time in each of these different things. So what if I take all the indicators of compromise that I've got and I start to visualize them in some way? Now, these are not absolute values. I can't tell you that an IP address is worth $4 or that one kilobyte of a binary is two hours of coding time. It's not that simple. But at least if I put all of the indicators that I've got for different APTs together, I can compare them. So I can't give you an absolute value, but I can show you that one of these teams spends a little bit more time uh, and effort on their infrastructure than another one. OK, what about frequency? How frequently do they operate? Can I create a ranked list of different APT groups in the world and see how much uh, they do at any given time? I can do this not just for events, but I can also do it for binaries. I can also do it for network addresses as sources or as destinations for exfiltration. Uh, we can do it with domain names. And you start to get a different sense of the, the operating rhythms and frequencies of the different APTs, but also how much infrastructure they throw at you at any given time. Um, this doesn't just work for attackers. You also, when you visualize data like this, you get to see some funny effects, right? It turns out all of you malware analysts in the room stop publishing binaries at the same time every year. You take a break for Christmas. And you know what? So do I. I don't look at ransomware for Christmas. It's not fun. Um, so we have to be a little careful about how we view these graphs in terms of the time domain, but they're still interesting in the sense of infrastructure, like which APT groups have more infrastructure than than another. And of course, this is a subjective view. This is taken from a malware information sharing platform uh, database that I, I like to use their projects and their products. Um, but then that means I have a selective view of the incidents that I know about. And you might have some incidents that you know about that are different than mine. But you can still use this code. Uh, the logistical budget uh, open source project is on GitHub. And you can use this to visualize your MISP data in these ways. And we're exploring doing that with uh, time domain as well, so you can see frequency over time. And the point is, you might have a different view of the attacks that you've seen, and you might rank a different threat actor higher than I do. Uh, that's fine. That's great. If my number three and your number three are in the same place, then at least we can trade indicators of compromise back and forth. So my point here is, we can quantify APTs, ongoing research. You could do research in this area. It would be very helpful. All right. Now, it's a short hop from quantifiable to insurable. If you have a population of companies that get hit with a certain frequency in a, in a breach or some sort of hacking event, I can start to give you a frequency. Not only can I give you that frequency of these thousand companies, I also want to make an important point. People have traditionally looked at risk from the point of view of vulnerability of the victims, right? As if, you know, one large company does better at security than another, and that's the most important factor in cyber risk. I would argue that it's not. The most important factor is the attackers. They have constraints. They have day jobs. They have to go home. They want to eat. They want to sleep. They can't sit around all day, every day, with unlimited resources owning us all the time. Now, they might have big budgets. They might have more time and manpower than some of us do. But the point is there's a constraint. So even if we have 50,000 companies in the world that are completely vulnerable, there's still a 
finite number of attackers moving through that space hitting some of these companies. And even if they could hit all of the companies, not, they're not going to hit them all every year. So this gives me some, some frequencies, right? And you can start to scale those risk frequencies and look at how often different companies in different sectors are getting breached. This leads you to some sort of division of the risk, right? The insurance companies can say, I know that if I'm going to insure an energy uh, company, they have this frequency of getting breached as opposed to financial services. And it's a start. You know, it's not ICS cyber physical, but this is a start. At least we can do breach insurance, and we have actuarial data for breach insurance, which is why that's uh, the easiest insurance for you to buy. But this isn't the only thing that we can quantize, right? I spent some time being asked, uh, part of the reason I work at the Risk Center is they ask me difficult questions. I really, really like difficult questions. And my boss asked me one day, what's the maximum DDoS that could occur? And it just hurt my head. It was, uh, it was not something I could answer. I felt like there were so many factors. I was kind of swimming in it. And then I realized I couldn't answer what the biggest DDoS could be. But maybe if you scratch away a little bit, you could talk about the number of reflectors that are on the internet for reflective DDoS. OK, it's not application. You know, it's not other kinds of DDoS. But at least for reflective DDoS, I could give you the number of reflectors, because we can scan large spaces of the internet, uh, especially IPv4. We can do it in a completest way. So we can see the number of reflectors. OK, so what if we take each one of those reflectors in a different protocol, say, SMTP, SNMP, uh, DNS, uh, NTP, we know their amplification factors. So we multiply all of those different uh, reflectors by their amplification factor. Uh, OK, well, that's not quite good enough, because we need to scale it down by bandwidth, right? Like the, the, the reflectors have a certain amount of bandwidth. Um, can I get a database of average bandwidths per country or per ASN? And it turns out that I can. And pretty soon, you can come to a certain number. And you can see the growth of those numbers. So if you take this view of risk to others, you'll see in the graph on the right-hand side, uh, I've put up the US, China, uh, Japan, and Russia. And then it's broken down into the individual protocols. And that's in terabits per second, right? So that's the risk to others. But if you can calculate the risk to others, you can also calculate the risk to yourself. Because you can sum up all of those other countries that might be throwing uh, DDoS traffic flows at you. Now, of course, we've never seen DDoS of this size. I don't think we actually can, because it's a core max flow problem. But it gives me a sense of like some upper limit. And then if you compare that to the actual DDoSs that we see over here in the, on the other side, the top uh, graph, the blue one, that is the potential. And then the one on the slightly right-hand side is the, the largest attacks we see. And roughly speaking, it's about 1 one-hundredth of this max potential that I've, that I've calculated. My point, DDoS maximums are calculable needs more research. We need to advance that. I could use your help. But we're slowly getting there. We're scratching away at the limitations of an attacker and their resources and what they can do. Ransomware. Ransomware is also insurable. You've seen a lot of these tables, like the one uh, here saying 88.4 million. That's the amount that different ransomware families made over time. But I'm less interested in how much money the bad guys made. I'm more interested in the incident response costs. And that means I'm interested in the incident response costs, not just to the people who paid the ransom, but also the people who didn't pay the ransom. That's frightfully important. Now, I apologize. I see right here I've made a mistake, and I've left you crypto defense and not Petya twice. There should be two more graphs down there. It's all right. The basic idea won't be important, or you'll still get the basic idea from these graphs. Uh, what is important here is that this is not a dollar price in the graphs, the blue graphs. This is unit payments. So single payments to Bitcoin accounts by uh, people paying ransoms, right? And these are taken from the 31,000 samples of ransomware that I pulled out all the Bitcoins and Monero addresses and Ethereum addresses. And then you just see how many payments that they receive over time. Why am I only interested in the number of payments and not the amount of money that they made? Because that's an indicator of the number of infections in the world. Right? If I know that one in five people pays ransom from talking to the insurers, then I can multiply these numbers by five, and I have a rough idea of the number of infections that are going on in the world. Then I can take a look at the average cost of a ransomware cleanup, regardless of whether you paid the ransom. Pretty soon, I have a sense of the average cost of ransomware as an ecosystem. I could even build a sort of national health service of ransomware if you were serious. So the companies could come to them, they could get served for free and go away, and somebody else could fund it however they want to fund it. And so ransomware is insurable. 
Next thing you know, we have insurance for this sort of thing. Next thing you know, it gets cheaper to buy defenses. It changes the entire ecosystem because the goal of the insurers is to actually get rid of the problem instead of just continuing to sell you antivirus. Cyber terrorism is now insurable in the UK. I'm very proud of this. We worked for a number of different years with Pool Re, the terrorism reinsurer, and the Center for Risk Studies. It took a long time to show them how we could quantify these things and to give them some access to the intelligence services for the level of attribution that they would require to pay out to their customers. Then, after that, the nuclear pools came along and said, we are interested in cyber insurance. What if one of these facilities, not necessarily generation, uh, you know, but also transport, transporting nuclear materials or research facilities. They don't have a budget for huge uh, you know, security teams, but they need some help in a crisis. So who's going to pay those incident response costs of Mandiant and FireEye and the other organizations in the room? The insurers, they can help out. That's what it's for. So again, very, very proud of this. It's early days. Um, there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through to get insurance for the nuclear sector, but you can get cyber physical damage insurance. So a few years ago, as I said, I spoke those words at S4. People didn't believe it. Here it is. It exists. You can go out and try it out. Maybe it doesn't work for you, but a wonderful thing that you could do in your facility is compare the offering of the insurer to the money that you've set aside yourself. You don't have to buy the insurance, just have a conversation with them. See what they think is important and what steps you should be following. In the early days, you'll read a lot of terrible, terrible um, application forms that just have very silly questions. But over time, it will get better. They're buying losses. They're buying experience and how people get hacked and what happens. So from it isn't possible at S415 to a $4.82 billion market since I was last here in front of you. And it's growing. It's growing at 25% per, per year for cyber insurance in its entirety, not just OT cyber insurance. Right? We brought over $8 billion in capacity from the UK alone. And again, very proud of that. I remember a conversation I had with Tim Roxy. I said, we're going to write this blackout report. Maybe some of you read it. Papers went nuts with it. It's going to look really bad. I'm sorry for all the bad press. But in the end, I will bring you $8 billion in capacity for cyber insurance that didn't exist before. And Tim said, we can handle that. We can handle bad press. I know what I'm doing. I'm a, a very talented guy. Many of you will know Tim Roxy. So he did a great job of weathering that storm that came out from the newspapers in our hypothetical report, and here you are. You know, you can get 100 million coverage. You can get 200 million coverage for these different things. That's four to 8,000 utilities that can have surge capacity in a crisis. Again, I think that's, that's important. It's also a market incentive for better behavior. As an insurer, you can go back and say, look, I'm not going to insure you unless you at least have an incident response team in-house. I need an interface to talk to you when I get there. I need you to be gathering some data and know what's going on. If you don't have that, you're not insurable. So now suddenly we have a market incentive for people to have their own incident response teams. And again, proud of that. One of my favorite people at Cambridge, um, some of my favorite hackers are not even computer scientists. John Crowcroft is a Natsuki, a, a natural scientist. Um, but he did so much programming. Um, you know, he, he was at the first 50 meetings of the IETF, which again, just blows me away. Um, and he once said to me, you know, if you want something done, tell a Cambridge hacker that it's impossible and it will be done in three years. And conversations with these guys are like living in the future. I mean, the last time I spoke to him, he was joking about edible drones. They would just fly into your mouth, right? And I was like, John, what are you talking about? Like, we're having a beer. Um, and he says, no, 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 I have a friend over at MIT. She's got a chocolate teapot that can hold one cup of tea. And the chocolate's made in a specific way with a 3D printer, so it's heat resistant, and it can survive one cup of tea. And with that, I would be able to build a hero's engine. Everyone in here knows hero's engine, right? The little steam engine that spins around. So like, you could make a chocolate drone, drone that would fly into your mouth. I love John. Anyways, that's a little bit of tangent. But uh, it's the morning, and, and I'm me and I go on tangents. So John Crowcroft is, is an epic guy, and uh, here you go. How do we do cyber physical risk quantification for management? What's the capex on your assets? Can you do a probable maximal loss? Find your worst safety case, that's your severity. Now work out a frequency. How do you work out a frequency? Do an attack plan. Sit down and do an attack tree on your network. How many different ways could you make this maximal loss happen? What do you estimate the frequency of that to be? Slowly, you have some uh, contingency funds that you need to make proportional to the risk that you, you assess. Maybe that number won't be quite correct, but it's a start. And the first thing you do is get one number wrong, publish it, 
and make refinement on those numbers as you go along. So what's the maximum number of compromised nodes I can tolerate in a distributed system or an industrial system? We know the answer to this, right? Byzantine generals, you all know your Turkish history and your computer science. Byzantine generals, one third. If you have integrity in your controllers and your sensors, if your communications are authenticated and you know that they're going back and forth, you can handle one third of the nodes in your system being compromised. That's relatively resilient. That's relatively resistant. Now, all of you in the room have encrypted comms for your sensors and actuators, right? And integrity in your controllers. No? Let's find out. This is a little bit of an aside as well, but I spent time with first.org. They were, they were my introduction to the incident response world. It's kind of the United Nations of incident response teams. There are epic arguments between different teams about different things. It's a wonderful place to be. And uh, this year, the conference is in Edinburgh, which is where I live. I love Edinburgh, Scotland. I almost came to you in a kilt, um, but I thought that might not be appropriate because I'm standing a little higher on the stage. Um, I don't like being up kilted. I think that's very inappropriate. So, uh, so I came to you in trousers. Uh, but this year, the first conference will be in Edinburgh, and I encourage you to come along, have a whiskey, have a dram, uh, join us. And the reason I'm asking you to join us is we have a special interest group for industrial control systems. So you have a space that you can go to and talk about industrial control system incident response. And I have just established the new cyber insurance uh, special interest group at first.org. So if you want to talk about some of these things, come there, have a chat. Um, it's very multinational, and I think that's a good thing for some of our research. All right, so this is the other complaint that I hear. Insurance steals my security budget. Really? Really? Your you know, preven prevention budget and your response budget are the same budget? We have different technologies for these things. Why don't we have different budgets for these things, right? Your security prevention team is one team, and yes, they might do some incident response work, but they don't have the same budget, nor should they. You know, we have fire alarms in our houses to warn us about the fires, but we also have a fire department. The response money is not the same as the prevention money, and you do those two jobs differently. So you can self-insure if you like. I do the same maths. I do the same maths, or math, since I'm back in America. Um, I do it for the insurers or the reinsurers or people who want to put aside some money on their own and create a risk captive. And I'm fascinated by risk captives at the moment. It's kind of a cool corporate structure. Inside the book, you'll find 10 open research problems. I apologize to my technical and hacker friends, my bit shifter friends in the audience. This was written for a lay audience. It's not written for technical people. But here are 10 open research problems that I think are serious and you could go away and solve. And unsurprisingly, you write something like this, you put it in a book, and then Eric Byers has basically solved one of them. Well done, Eric. That's what I would expect. Um, but by putting these problems out there, more people can think about them, and I think that's great. So if you think you understand cyber risk, it's essentially the asymmetry of information, right? So what's the cyber risk of me releasing a vulnerability in the next slide? You're all nervous now, aren't you? I love this moment, it's kind of exciting. The suspense is terrible, I hope it'll last. Vote GOAT. You can still grep for vulnerabilities in switches in 2019. I have not reported this. Technically, it's not a vulnerability. I'm just saying that if you ran these commands on a machine, you too could have a CVE. So if you're a poor little bit shifter hacker kid and you haven't got your first CVE number, here it is. Go and have it. It's like candy to the audience, right? Like, there are private keys and switches, private keys for everyone. It's a wonderful place. You should have a collection of these keys. So hopefully, those of you who have been here for years and years remember that we have this tradition. No goats, no votes. Um, I hope we keep that tradition alive at S4. I know it's a big conference now. There's a lot of people here. Um, but goats are cool. My mom has a goat farm. That's kind of how I got in, interested in infrastructure and, and farming and so on. So you can still use this command, and I particularly encourage you to take pictures of that grep because that's a really handy way. I remember I spoke to Ilya Van Sprundle at IOActive, an amazing hacker, and I said to him one day, how do you find so many vulnerabilities? And he went, I just grep for them. So I thought, if I'm going to just grep for things, what am I going to do? I'm going to like grep for Bitcoin uh, accounts, Bitcoin private keys and ransomware. That's fun. Um, but you can also grep for private keys in firmware images, and you can still find them. So enjoy that. Have a good day. Switches get stitches.